Thank you, Alan, for joining us today. Uh, I did see one of your, uh, you know, yesterday's U.S. Senate hearings where the lady was asked what preparation has she done and what are the notes that she was carrying. And she showed, she showed an empty page. And I promise you, Ellen, that there are people like CTL and Natesh who gave me copious notes and I ignored them. <laughs> and I have the same, the same empty page that your new Supreme Court judge will show you. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, 2009 is when Tek Mahendra took over Satyam. And one of the first few calls that I made was to Ellen. And uh, Ellen said, count me as a friend. Satyam was my first SI partner when I started the company. And uh, I will always stand by Satyam and I'll, I will be your partner for life. Now this is Alan. He didn't want to know uh, who committed the fraud. He did not want to do my CT scan to figure out, you know, whether we were the right people behind the acquisition. It was more of trusting his own emotions and spirit. Little bit fast forward. This was 2009, as you would remember. And I, me and Alan would meet about twice a year and get along well, we, you know, more often he would pull my leg and I would smile. But there were few things in common that I would call. Uh, one was, you know, that legacy or the background of where his mother is an immigrant or his parents as survivors and how they traveled, how they set up a restoration business uh, and his family values. And many of you who have dealt with Pega would have dealt with his younger brother. I don't know, the elder or younger, I'm sorry. I don't know, Leon and uh, uh, you know, and you would realize that a very professional company, but in their heart, they are a family. And everybody in his team is like a family to Alan. So in a way it resonated and many of you know that is how we have built Tech Mahendra. The second part was, I think Alan, it was 2011 when your mother uh, started a, a series of advice on, uh, as an advertisement for Pega, was it 2011? It was, it was, and uh, it, it was less advertisements than I would say of her own amusing and sarcastic take on the technology industry. But uh, again, you know, and all of you, I mean, I, I, I think I should have played it for you. These are not big uh, excerpts. Uh, I remember watching three and I, walked up to Alan and I said, Alan, again, this is a similarity. Uh, my mother taught me, uh, she used to ask me every day, how was the day? And my reply used to be good. And she said, no, don't tell me how good it was, how productive it was. Similarly, if you see Dorothy's advice to both Alan and Leon, you would realize nothing comes for free. Don't get sucked into uh, buying half and then building the next full number three. I mean, uh, uh, read between the lines and look for the proper configuration. I mean, again, as I said, this is speaking from an empty paper. So the advertisement or those three lessons that I, you know, went through that time, it was very, very clear that uh, we have a lot in common between Alan and some of us. The third part, in a lot of ways, which resonated was, Pega was not trying to be a 
package software company it wanted a solution for its clients and we worked with pega now for many many customers and it is not that we treat every customer as pre configured bicycle i think one of the advertisement was on oh sorry the advice was on one was an aeroplane one was bicycle anyway even the third one will come to me or oh, trains yeah uh, so it was very very clear is that a customer ultimately is looking for a level of hand holding a level of customization but it should not be that a customization never ends so i think it was again a wonderful scenario and the last is whenever i met uh, you know alan he has always had sights on future he has continued to always surprise me four years ago when i met him he said automation i mean i haven't met him now but i'm sure if i meet him now he'll probably be talking quant computing uh, so my point is a man who is so humble so nice uh, but very firmly looking at the future so i can only say proud to call alan as a friend uh, i know ctl only talks to billionaires but i know alan not as a billionaire but as a person who will help tech mahindra build a future so welcome to the prime time alan there is a lot more we can talk about your chess uh, at one day i do want to ask that question to leon was he always eating or was it was it dorothy trying to prove a point that you were a good chess player and uh, leon was always uh, uh, you know enjoying his food but <laughs> so two things because you've mentioned them several times there are four four minute videos that okay. have gotten I very good reviews i didn't see the fourth one i stand corrected yeah there are four of them um I, what i must tell you is my brother and my cto don sherman and my head of events mike brenner who historically has put on pega world though obviously pega world has changed this year since we've gone virtual the three of them snuck behind my back and made the first two and the first time i sh- i saw them was in a public place with 600 partners in the room <laughs> let's good. just say I, i was pretty shocked <laughs> but in a good way and then they made two more so, that's very but, very good another traveler <laughs> there is so much we can talk but all i wanted to say is if you are looking at uh understanding the role of ai both in a social context and in the business context if you are looking at digital and you know in a lot of ways uh you know what digital and customer experience mean there cannot be a better choice than ln and frankly uh, if you ever get a chance do our ctl uh, you know uh, what does he talk to the billionaire friends so a man i mean again alan behind pega alan behind the technological changes and revolution alan the entrepreneur Welcome, welcome, welcome to Tech Mahindra. Well, thank you so much. And you know, going back to the Satyam days, and then the transition to Tech M, and I think a partnership that has proven itself over many years. Uh, I am, am pleased to respond to your request to talk to the team, and and glad to share um, not just stories about my mother, though I do think the mother Treffler videos are definitely worth. looking up but uh i think we have both a great history together and i'm enormously excited about the future you know i can remember starting pega when there were just three of us and it was started in a kitchen with the vision of how to really make in that era of very large companies more productive more effective bring business and IT together to work in in very different ways 
I mean, it has been a, a set of major transitions. You know, this platform we built, which originally was referred to as a workflow platform, though I never liked the word workflow because I always thought it should be work do, not just flow the work, um, it was what sustained the company and got it through its earliest days. Uh, over a decade ago, we acquired and then really built in uh, AI capabilities so that you have the combination of making smart decisions, but also then being able to execute them and drive that work to done. Where today that work might include robotics, but very importantly, it includes the ability to uh, bring together all the different types of complexity and sophistication, but also do it in a way that can be fast and light. You know, one of the first systems of scale that we did together was the work we did at Ford um, in the global warranty area, where Ford um, was our first warranty system. We now have dozens of them, and I think we've got a partnership that really builds on that sort of aftermarket services or something. But you know, a system to handle Ford and problems with warranties and problems with warranty parts and all of that globally was something that very few people had done and done successfully. And they were able to use our platform and your skills to be able to deliver that. But almost on the opposite side of the spectrum, Ford decided that they had all these little apps that were written in Excel or, or Access databases or, or Lotus Notes or other sort of one-off things. So Ford said, hey, look, we don't just want to be able to use this platform for this enormously sophisticated, very, very key to mission critical business, you know, warranty and service platform. We also want to use this for quick apps. Apps that might be constructed in a day or two to meet specific purposes but still should be mission critical and should be reliable and, and not be sitting on somebody's personal laptop. So we set up over 650, what we call app factory apps, which are low code, easy to implement apps. So what I'm excited about is that for our customers, we have the capability to go the entire range from light fast apps to serious business, to being able to, as Ford has, incorporate robotics to do the end-to-end -end automation when there are no APIs. And you know, we've it's been a pleasure for us to grow with our customers and with great partners like you to be able to provide this. We've we've now gone from uh, you know I know by by your standard CP these aren't big numbers, but you know we're now 5,700 people around the world and you know, more than a billion in US revenue in the last 12 months. And I'm extremely excited about the future and especially coming out of this pandemic and coming out of the world moving to microservices and cloud native architecture, I've been spending a tremendous amount of my time over the last nine months really reworking the design of our sixth generation from complete scratch rewrite of how PEGA thinks about what the future is going to be while doing it in a way that works with our prior generations. And I'm happy if you're interested to talk to you about that future or anything else I can uh, offer you or your team. Right, and um, Alan, thank you, uh, you know, for the address, this is CTL here. And uh, I just wanted to share a, a couple of things, you know, before we get started on the Q&A. Uh, yeah, got, this, you know, isn't gonna, this isn't going to involve running to New York to secure an <laughs> passport, is it? How can we? How can we ever forget that day? But uh, you know, CP alluded, uh, Alan and I joined uh, Tech Mahindra ten years ago when CP called me, and we had acquired Satyam, and we had to turn around. And I happened to be in Boston, and I was told that listen. You know, Pega is in Boston. It's an important partner. You should be the executive sponsor. Little did I know that uh, this is going to spawn, you know, 10 years. This is my 10th year in Tech Mahindra, and uh, it's been 10 years of association for me. Uh, but I'm the youngest in this batch. You know, Natesh graduated out of college 18 years ago, and the only thing he's done is Pega. He dreams and sleeps Pega. And his boss, Sriram, is uh, 24 years in the company. 
and uh, he's the one who started the pega relationship so it's it's very deeply personal you know as well as professional for all of us involved in this relationship and uh, you know i we've learned a lot from pega in our interactions with uh, uh, leon with you with the entire leadership team and we are very grateful you know for the for for the vision with which you've driven this whole enterprise and the opportunities that you've brought to all of us to grow both personally and professionally alan and uh, uh, you know there were a couple of things that i wanted to you know share before i you know throw it open uh, your pega event you know the uh, the pega conference uh, the chess that you know that you play with 20 25 people sitting across is the first time i saw uh you know partners customers so it was an event where you know you were i i just can't even phantom how you can think of each move as you walk across and just keep moving the uh, the the coins across the desk you know uh, across the board as you move forward but it's amazing to watch and i can tell you that that event is as anticipated as your uh, as the other events in the pega conference right and so uh well, the second thing that i wanted to share was the one day at new york i think you know uh, i don't know how it happened why it happened and we won't we won't go through you know all the events that happened that day but i got to observe you that one day at close quarters and i saw the intensity that made you know pega what it is today you know people would have said this is impossible and walk away and i saw you standing there saying i will not take no for an answer <laughs> right and that incident was all over and long blown i was in the pega office for a, for a meeting and i was pulled in saying that you know alan wants to meet you and i said that was not on the calendar and uh, the photograph shows that you know you gave me that ornately you know uh, the chess board that's very ornately very nicely done even to get that you know to give it as a corporate gift you, you know how much thinking would have gone into it and alan that is in our drawing room every day when me and madhu sit down to have coffee we we'll, you know it's there right before us you know it's, it's very deeply personal that you remembered it you thought about it small things that matter uh, that's something that i've learned from you that small things make a big impact right and uh, and the third thing that i wanted to share with you is that uh, you know this market is growing you know so rapidly and uh, you know we've done this warranty magic that you alluded to and we want to do what velocity something bigger then what velocity is to a competitor that we will not name right you know create something bigger you know for pega and uh, you know techm should be involved in doing that we have the ideas we are working with your team on that and finally you know bringing memories back to life was what your parents did you know when they started this organization and you know uh, the art restoration that you that you were involved with personally and in today's market you know the market is in disarray the digital revolution is sweeping uh, you know we, uh, siloed organizations you know we thought would have evaporated they're still there and i think you're reinventing the future uh, and uh, we are glad to be participating in this reinvention and thank you for taking us on this jo- uh, on, on this journey i wanted to talk about your mother but cps talked enough and so you know we we'll let it rest you know what she said at the conference are also a guiding force for all of us and with that uh, we'll throw it open to q and a uh, and we know that your time is valuable if you're spending it with us we know that how how you value techm and we are very grateful uh, for this journey alan over to uh, the moderator for the questions from the team yeah thank you thank you ctl uh... you know uh, this this uh, a lot of folks you know uh, waiting curiously to you know ask uh, alan and the team uh, some questions uh, you know before i turn over uh, alan if if you want to take a couple of minutes to outline uh, you know the excitement around pegas change in positioning and uh, what it means to to customers and you know to to partners like tech mahindra um, you know then we can switch to the questions Sure. So one of the things that I find really interesting is that when I started Pega over 3 decades ago it was partially because I thought that computers were getting much faster but they were still so complicated to use for people to define the the way they wanted their businesses to operate and their processes R- required writing specifications required being able to to 
you know, we now call them user stories, but you know, back then they were these big requirement stocks. And then human beings would translate that into literally, you know, the language of the machine using technologies like you know, C plus plus or or basic or or you know PL1. And the original vision was can we create more of a model-driven environment where you can capture the process flows and the decision criteria and the rules and all of those core elements into a platform, into a database, and then from that database have the system be able to actually write code that was not changeable because we wouldn't want to lose connection between the model and the running system, but that was was capable of doing very substantial things. And I think some of the inspiration for that came from what was emerging then as the CAD CAM business, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. Because you know, years before, when people wanted to create a new car, they would build it in clay. Or architects would manually draw very, very detailed architectural documents on paper. They would draft them. But with CAD CAM, you could use a computer. And the computer would help make sure you got it right. It would make it easy to make certain changes. And you know, then with 3D printing, eventually, you can go from the model right to the actual finished product. So one of the questions that we had was, why can't we make computer software closer to this? Now, people had tried to create what were called fourth and fifth generation languages. But they pretty much failed. They had not fit the bill. So our question is, how can we do this differently? We go forward many years, and we go th forward through complete different generations. You know, my first generation of software, um, and and by the way, they haven't let me write any computer code for a long time, but <laughs> a very long time. But uh, I'm still very involved in the design and the architecture at a at a quite deep technical level. That's something I enjoy quite a bit. Our, our first computers that we ran on was something called DECVAXs or IBM CICS, big mainframes. And we actually had a model that could run on either, that you could run on DEC, and if you want to move to the mainframe and you know run on the database called DB2, you'd run it there. You could go back to DEC, run it on Oracle, and we had a lot of flexibility in that original vision of the system. It was written in a language called PL1, which was considered a very fancy language at the time uh, here. Now, obviously, we went through many generations as we changed the vision. And, you know, PEGA today is a really in an interesting place because our core system is historically been written in Java for the last couple of years. And it actually is written in Java and actually writes Java as, as well. But as we decided we wanted to make PEGA able for the next decade to meet many, many new challenges, we launched a new product, a pr new project, I'm sorry, called Project Phoenix, to reinvent many parts of the system in a truly microservices cloud native way. And we've been reworking pieces of the system. But because it's model driven, if people have been in our application studio, which is our preferred way to develop, if they've been following our design principles, and our design principles are that you should identify a system by understanding the micro journeys, I think the workflows you go through, you should understand the personas, who are the different people who are going to use each stage of the micro journey. And you should understand the data so that you can control the data coming in and out and then maintain a case, which you know, basically is a documentation of how you made a decision, what steps did you take in a process, you know, what outcome did you achieve, that you can go back to two years later to prove that you actually handled this particular transaction fairly or created an optimal outcome. And that model, we have been working on enables you to be able to use PEGA 
as you've already defined in what we call pega infinity, but also run it in very, very different ways. And part of this has been to our transition to the cloud. Today, more than 60% you know, of my business runs on what we call pega cloud, which is a complete managed cloud service that we offer. And obviously being able to do that has required a lot of changes to the architecture, but we also run on what we call client cloud which is, so when Google runs us, they run us on GCP, the Google Cloud Platform. And we have many customers who run off on Microsoft Azure because that's kind of, they've moved their whole data center out and they don't want to be running on Pega Cloud. They want this to be a part of their data center infrastructure. So by using this model, we've been able to offer our customers tremendous choice. And at the same time, uh, offer us the ability to advance the product through this Phoenix architecture. Phoenix continues to show enormous promise as we have broken the system into what we call backing services. We're working to make it multi-tenant and able to be run by ISV. So a company like Tech Mahindra might choose Pega to be a platform that it would use for a multi-customer, single uh, multi-tenant platform. Not quite there yet, but as we go into 2021, that's one of our big goals. So we continue to, to use this. It's funny because we're now using a computer language called Kotlin, which actually compiles into Java. It's kind of the next big thing after Java. That works perfectly with Java, so we're, it's all fine. But the whole key I would tell you, what I find fascinating is um, a couple of things and then we'll open it up to questions. The first is having become so involved in working on the cloud. It has reinforced my sense that the cloud and microservices have made things much harder for people to build software. On one hand, it's easier. I mean, I had to go out and buy a deck Vax for $400,000, which was a lot of money back then to start the business. But today you could just jump on Amazon's cloud and you know, begin almost for free. But what's hard is there is so much software, so much complexity, so many pieces that it is, it is difficult for customers to get this right, particularly with security and other enormously sensitive topics. If you go to just AWS or Azure and look at their catalog of products, their catalog of software products goes on for pages and pages and pages. And you know, it makes you wonder, you know, what is a Route 53? You know, and you have to know all this stuff to be able to make the systems work. With our model, we're able to tremendously simplify this. The second thing we're able to do is with our model, we're able to handle some of the gaps in microservices. A lot of us grew up with something called multi-phase or two-phase commit where you could always be sure that if you wrote the data to the database, you know, the data to the database for the debit, and you wrote the data for the credit, that the debit and credit would both happen or neither would happen. But in the world of microservices, that's not true because the services are not controlled by a common infrastructure. That's part of their power, but also part of their weakness. Into our core platform, we have the concept of transactionality so that we can make sure that even if you're calling services that are disconnected, or even if you're typing from a robot into a backend ugly system that doesn't have an API, that you'll know the state of what you were trying to accomplish without having to worry too much about it, with having that built in. The third thing we're doing, and you can actually see this in our 8.5 release, is we're supporting React components, state-of-the-art React components, in our UI, and then you can actually drop React components into our UI, and customers are using this and loving it as, as sort of a very modern way to evolve. Eventually our UI will be 100% React and 100% SPA, single page application. So we're making huge technical advances. But the most important thing I'd like to talk to you about is something that I highlighted at, my, at Pega World. So if you haven't seen my 16 minute keynote, from Pega World, I would advise that you go see it. And that highlight was about not just the need for technical architecture, 
but the need for business people to have a business architect. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the current environment today, with microservices at the back end and the need to operate on a mobile device or a web platform or a contact center, now more than ever, people are building business logic in the front end. And even if they use APIs, which is great, you still need to know that to dispute a credit card charge, these are the fields I need to send to the system for the dispute. And that involves more and more business logic. We have created a new style called the Digital Experience API, which is all open. It's been around for about two years. It's had brilliant results. And if you're a PEGA person and don't know what the DX API is, you should really look at it because it's very powerful. That lets you keep all the rules and process definitions in the center, but tells the front end, whether it's a PEGA front end, whether it's an HTML front end, whether it's a you know, Swift iPhone front end, tells the front end what to paint in real time. So the front end can just worry about painting the pixels, but all of the business logic and process logic lives in the center. We've also insulated that center from differences in the back end data. So that if, for example, we're sitting in front of, as, as we do at some of our large customers like Unilever, we're sitting in front of multiple SAP systems that are a little bit different. As the data comes into PEGA, if it's already not in a standard format, we make it a standard format, both in and out. That enables you to have processes that can be global, even if the data stores in different parts of the world or different parts of the business are local. We call this business architecture a center out architecture. The center should be where the brain is, right? The intelligence, where the processes are defined and where the cases, the records of what you're doing are kept. And I will tell you that as I have taught to actual CEOs who start by saying, oh, I'm not technical, but we talk about this and say, don't you find that you're writing business logic and it's so expensive to make this front end work like this front end? Every CEO knows that. The technical people certainly know it and the business people know it because they are suffering. Well, this business architecture, we would say is a way to build systems from the center out, whether you use PEG as a platform or not. And I think it has been having great success. It will continue to have great success. And I would encourage TechDem to, to build on this emerging way of thinking as a way to both differentiate yourselves in the market, to sound like we sound. And I, I think you could become leaders in this new mental model that I've never been so sure that something is right for the next decade. And that you're gonna see a lot of very exciting announcements and developments of um, over the next six to 12 months. So I'll pause now and answer questions, but that's what we've been up to. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think it's pretty uh, exciting. Definitely, yeah, definitely very exciting, Alan. Uh, you yeah. know, on a lighter note, you know, many of us have enjoyed the situation layer cake and with your guidance to go center out on the cake, I think a lot of customers and prospects would want to go after it. Um, so we'll we'll switch to, uh, you know, the Q and A segment now, uh, you know, uh, we'll start off with, um, you know, uh, Harshwadhan Soin, who's our chief people officer. And, uh, you know, he has a question uh, to you, Alan. Yeah, hi, Alan. Thank you, and great to catch up again. I know last time we met in Canada, and you were still looking as dapper as you are today. So, so thank you, and it was wonderful a uh, few words that uh, you, you spoke. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure. I do have a question for you. Yeah, the question, Alan, for you is, you know, in, pa in the pandemic, we've all been exploring what has changed in leadership and what should we look at uh, when we look at leaders? So what are the qualities that you're looking at? Uh, and that's the first part. The second part is, so has it changed for you? Have, have the qualities or what you look for in leaders today, has it changed post the pandemic? So 
would love to hear your thoughts, uh, Alan. Well, the pandemic has had many, uh, many influences on obviously the the our customers, the business, uh, personal life, the the life of our staff and their families. And I think uh, you know a couple of observations um, that that I think are true for us, and I think are also true for for TCAM. I think the uh, the reality is, and this is not my original line, so feel free to use it, but I like it. It's uh, the reality is we are all in the same storm, but we're in very different boats. And there are some companies like Pega, like TechM, where the pandemic actually reinforces the urgency of sustainable digital transformation. And so in terms of our, of our team and our staff, we've been able to be very supportive of, uh, of them not laying people off. We, we actually created a fund where we would do matching gifts. We've, we've brought in over a million dollars and we will actually uh, give money to our lower income staffs, uh, staff who, who uh, you know, might have two working parents where one has lost their job so that they can maintain the families. I think that the, the pandemic has forced us to look at our situation and find opportunities for empathy, both in our staff and in our communities. And I, you know, I, I believe that it's easy for us to become aggravated and tired, and this is an enormous drain. But every morning we need to wake up and say, look, we're the ones who are in a position to do positive things here. We need to listen carefully to our staff and to others and figure out how we make it so we get through this and maintain our humanity, because that's very, very easy to be threatened. We do a lot of time from a leadership point of view, communicating. We, we have what we call check-in chats, where we uh, let anybody in the company ask an anonymous question and they get voted up and down. And then myself and the senior leadership take all questions. And it's all public, so you know, there's no, no, place, no, place to, uh, <laughs> no place to hide. And you know, we do that, originally we were doing them every two weeks. We're now doing them every three to four weeks. Um, there. We have communications that go not just from the senior leadership, but from leaders throughout the company that two or three times a week, one of them will tell their personal story. For example, just yesterday, my CISO, who's a wonderful guy named Carlos Fuentes, um, told his story about how he, um, he's in his 50s, so this is going to sound a little scary. Um, he, he has been training for his ambition to become a, a, a bull rider and to actually compete in the elder section of a, uh, of a professional rodeo. Now, I've told them this doesn't sound a lot like the guy I want doing risk management, but uh, I will tell you, he's really, really good at the risk management. And I, 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 I hope we will become equally good at bullfighting, uh, bull riding. They're not fighting them, but they, they ride on them. For like eight seconds right. or nine seconds till they're thrown off. I, uh, I I saw him after his first rounds of training, and let's just say, hit, his left arm took a long time to recover from it. So I have not encouraged him to go back, but I don't think there's any stopping him. So you know, we get to know uh, through these efforts, both collectively how to operate as a company, and I think a lot of very personal stories. And I would just encourage people to to be as as visible and open. Um, as it is, I'm, I'm sure you're doing many things across Tech M to maintain the culture and the continuity as well. well. Thank you so much. I think what I take away from what you've said is really empathy. Uh, leaders have to be empathetic and, of course, uh, still not lose hope. So thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful uh, insight that we got, Alan. Thank you. Over to you, Nitesh. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh and Alan. Uh, the next question, um, you know, is, um, you know, from Padma. Padma leads our digital and business consulting initiatives. Uh, Padma, if you can uh, unmute and ask your question. Uh, sure. 
Uh, thanks, Helen. I think that was fascinating. And uh, for a person who started her career on deck wax, that, that was a lot of old memories coming back. <laughs> okay. so, yes, and they were wonderful machines. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't last. So lo lots of uh, organizations, actually probably a little later than you in the next decade or after, did try to go for this holy grail of um, you know, uh, allowing people to define business requirements directly on the software and then getting that generated. And most of them actually failed. I mean, I know we, we work very closely with one of them, a company called FTI, um, which finally you know, decided to sell the data model rather than the actual um, software itself. So what do you think differentiated Pega and you know, made you so successful in that space where very few survived? Well, I, I think that um, we're very stubborn and don't give up easily. And it's a much, the you know, if you think about, for example, you know, BPM process as it has been described, right? You know, it sounds so easy. You just, you just create a couple of shapes and you hook them together and, you know, then the system runs them. And if you use a common notation, you'll be able to use it across all processes and around the world. You know, these promises, were, as we saw from the beginning, oversimplistic. And the reality is, if you don't understand the, the richness of the problem, it's very easy to create a solution that takes you a certain part of the way and then breaks. And when those solutions break, they tend to break very badly. And they tend to be very mysterious there. So I'll give you an example of how, how our thinking has evolved. And when we started, we pretty much thought everything was a process. And, you know, so people would go and they draw process diagrams. In fact, sometimes you'd get a customer back when we used to be able to meet together and you'd get like 15 people from the customer in a room and they would begin to draw processes on the wall. You know, they put white paper up on the wall and draw process, process, process. And they'd immediately begin to fight because one group would say, I do it this way, and another group would say, no, no, this customer needs it differently. And then they would begin putting data retrieval steps into the actual process, which would make them very non-reusable because you might want to use the same process with data that's a little bit different. And as we came to understand these problems, we changed our mind in very major ways about how to build this. So our, our latest versions, the Infinity Series 8485, um, really reverses the thinking. This, this process thinking tended to start by people drawing the pictures left to right, end to end. But center out really says, what is the core work you're trying to achieve? Don't worry so much to start what it looks like on the mobile phone, on the web, or in the call center. Say, what are, the, what are the outcomes I want? You know, in a health plan, maybe I want to record that a child has been born and added to the family. Or in a telco, maybe I want to add another mobile phone or retain a customer with an offer who's at risk of leaving. Those, we call them micro journeys. They're at the center of your business. And then we have ways that we can snap on across the different channels and snap on across the different data sources and wrap it all in a case. So right from the beginning, you think of a case as holding your work and letting you be in effect stateful right from the inception. That's a very major set of changes. And I think it's to the credit of the PEGA team that as we encountered problems, we were willing not just to address them in the current context, but in a context that looked at the problem differently. That's where things like the layer cake were born. I don't want to have a process that has all these branches in it that becomes enormously complicated. You know, I want to be able to have a process where a piece of it can be overridden by name. You know, so really bringing object-oriented principles uh, into the concept of case and process definition. I, I think that you know, when we started doing that, some of our competitors would make fun of us and say, oh, Pega, you know, it's complicated, it's, it's you know, very, very sophisticated, but you know, it's like using 
the we have one competitor who loves to say that it's like using a uh, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Well, we didn't like that. So we began working on making it simpler. And in fact, now I think we have succeeded in making the system tremendously simpler so that it's possible for uh, people to very quickly come in and build simple apps, but, but know that they have the industrial strength to, to do things that are sophisticated when they need to. And Ritesh, do I have your permission to squeeze in a question, you know, get ahead of the queue of the others? Just one quick question for Alan. Uh, absolutely. No one can refuse you. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Alan, you know, I have, uh, you know, observed Pega closely at work, right, for 10 years now. And I was talking to Leon and I said, Leon, you know, the one word that comes, if there's one word that comes, it's intensity. Any, any PE, you know, you talk to an alliance person, you talk to a salesperson, the intensity with which they approach. Now, I've seen you at the Wall Street Journal, CEO conference. You're like as if that new trainee who's joined Pega first day. You're up early, you're networking with people constantly. You're so, you know, I mean, I know that you're sourcing leads, you know, connecting with the CEOs across the room. So, what is the magic behind the success of Pega over these 10 years? I don't think it's an accident. There's a culture that's gone into it. What kind of culture have you built in this organization? And how do you make this? How do you translate? You have a vision. How do you translate that into reality? Well, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, culture is not something to be taken for granted. It requires constant work and constant attention. Um, you know, the, the thing that I'll say about myself is that I like what I do. <clears throat> I mean, maybe not every minute of every day, but in general, I think what I do is intellectually stimulating. It helps me meet lots of great people. It lets me do things that influence the lives of others. And I think that's exciting. And it's something I, I have pride in. And I think when, I would say this both to employers, but also to staff who are looking for a job, I think it's very important that a company like us hires that people, when they're looking for something to do, hold themselves accountable to having pride in their work. It's not just a job. We're, we're doing things that are reflections of who we are as people. And I think if you get people who enjoy what they do and have pride in their work, you just naturally get a level of excitement and intensity that can build on itself. You know, one of the other things we've really tried to do, particularly as the company has grown so much, is trying to make sure that we're keeping a external perspective. How, how do others see us? Not compare us to ourselves, but compare us to the expectations of customers, the expectation of the market, what we hear from partners, all of those constituencies, constituencies we need to be listening to very, very carefully. And so for instance, we recently, we changed our entire um, job review function. We used to have a very normal sort of thing where you would tell people if they like meet expectations or exceed expectations. Do you guys do something like that? Yeah, we, we do, we do. Yeah, so we, we, we radically changed it because they were our expectations. <laughs> they weren't the expectations of the market. And we've really moved so that we're now saying, how do we compare to the state-of-the-art publicly traded software firm? How does this individual compare to all the other lead system architects that are out there? Mm. Which is a little tricky because it's not a precise science but it at least gets people thinking from more of a, a external perspective as opposed to just, historically I think companies, especially when they grow, can become very internally focused. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the mistakes. I think that also helps us build excitement because when you see what you're doing, uh, then, you feel good. So, you know, you guys, of course, all use Scrum, we do too. We, we've added a new stage to our Scrum methodology called done, done. 
You know, there's the definition of done. Well, we have the definition of done done. And done done is adopted. You're not done until somebody outside is using it. That's your real measure. Oh, and by the way, they should be happy here. So I, th I think by incorporating external engagement and hiring people who have pride in their work, you, uh, you, you really have a foundation to create an Does that make sense? Oh, very insightful, Alan. Thank you. And sorry, I bypassed somebody else. You know, over to you, Nitesh. No worries, uh, CTL. Uh, next question is from uh, L. Ravichandran, who is our Chief Operating Officer. Uh, over to you, Ravi. Hey, Alan, good morning. And it was great, I think, after so many years, I am uh, uh, hearing PL1 and Two-Face coming. <laughs> 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 And it's basically because I've also basically started uh, COBOL and PL1 many, many decades ago. When we, when we started the company, we knew we wanted to run on multiple platforms. We knew we wanted to run on, on DECVAX because we couldn't afford a mainframe. But we also wanted to be able to run on CICS, which architecturally they're very different. And that gave us a choice of three languages. We could either write an assembler, which would be pretty crazy, Right, we could we could write in uh, in COBOL, but back then COBOL didn't know what a pointer was, and if you're building AI systems, you kind of need pointers. And uh, we could write in PL one, so we all learned PL one, and that's what we did. <laughs> good, and and I think second thing is I'm personally I'm a big kind of history enthusiast of World War Two. I have visited uh, Krakow, Warsaw. I have. And so is really basically deeply touched by I I can heard about your story. And that's on the personal side. And the question I wanted to ask was that uh, how do we replicate the warranty? How do we co-develop business applications along with your team so that we, we can look at telecom, we can look at banking and financial sector, we can look at healthcare, these uh, basically three areas. And of course, the manufacturing is other applications of warranty with all the factory of the future and industry 4.0. And what is the next uh, basically application on the manufacturing side? And uh, how do you view a partner like us co-developing these business solutions along with you? That is there a, is there a program you, you, you want to support and you want to encourage like partners like us? So I, I want to encourage them, but frankly, today there are some limitations in the software that make that a little more difficult. We are very much working between the next two releases that are coming out between now and sometime next year to make it so it would be easy for what I would describe as an ISV partner, which I would think of as you're building an application to bring yeah. to market, you're really an ISV partner. And what you wanna do is make it easy to write an application that yeah. different customers can adjust in limited ways and can be easy to upgrade and yeah. will allow multiple customers to be able to share a common platform. And so we've done a lot of work to support that. I think we're probably about you know, three quarters of the way done but we need to do some more to be able to make that. Today, the only reason why you could really do that would be, you know, in our last two releases, we've introduced uh, containerization in Kubernetes. And you, can, you could run multiple customers without having them each have their own physical platform, it would be a virtual platform, but we're looking to do much better than that and support full multi-tenancy of the model in the work with, do next year. I think that's what will make it easier. And I you know, would keep your eyes open for the next in the next six months to see where we are by Pega World. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. So thanks, Ravi. Thank you, Alan. So Alan, uh, you know, uh, every event, uh, you know, CTL talked about, you know, the concurrent chess activity with, with multiple participants. Uh, you know, in this format, we thought we'll, you know, do some kind of a compensation to something like that, that uh, participants are used, uh, you know, to experience. 
So our substitute for that in this event is is a rapid fire questions. You know that Brenda uh, will uh, you know will will initiate. Uh, can we start that? Sure. Thanks, Natesh. Yeah, thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, it's a pleasure listening to you and love the stuff that you spoke about communications and the culture bit. Yeah, uh, great stuff there. And uh, Natesh has very kindly allowed me to put you on a spot. Um, so like he mentioned, it's rapid fire questions and we're hoping for some smart, uh, quick and well, interesting answers. Yeah. Uh, so here we go. Uh, three words your friends would use to describe you. Wow, I would say um, energetic, persistent, and some would say stubborn. <laughs> okay. Uh, if there was one thing in history that you could change, what would it be? Uh, just one. Yes, just one. I, uh, <laughs> I, um, I think that uh, if you look back to the world wars that we were through that were so traumatic, certainly there are several things there that could have uh, you know, say tens of millions or you know, hundred million people. Sure. Stop. Okay. And now you need to pick a favorite. I'm going to say a few words, and you need to pick a favorite amongst them. Uh, chess, computers, or ping pong. Ah, uh, ping pong. Okay. <laughs> That's a surprise. Yeah. Texting or talking? Uh, I think talking. Okay. Passion or process? Oh, passion, for sure. Okay, Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi? That's your wife. <laughs> yes. Don't answer, Alan, don't answer. <laughs> That's a trick question I was talking about. <laughs> After 28 years of marriage, it's definitely wife. <laughs> okay, your inspiration, Gary Kasparov or Bobby Fischer? Uh, I like Kasparov better. Fischer was a nut. Okay. Okay. So, Alan, we have a special young guest tonight. Yeah. And uh, his name is Tanish. Uh, he has participated in the fourth All India Chess Federation uh, way back in 2015. And uh, when he did participate, he won the gold medal in the under five age category. Uh, so, he's around 10 years today. And uh, he has a question for you. So, uh, Tanish, if you could please come on screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, Tanish. Go ahead, ask your question. Okay. Hello, sir. Hello, madam. Uh, hello, all of you who have joined this meeting. Uh, I have one question in chess that, uh, uh, sir, which was your favorite opening in chess and why? So I used to open with the queen's pawn, the deep pawn. <laughs> But now I've been opening with the e pawn, the, the pawn in front of the king, because it's a little more feisty. It's a little more, more active. But when I was younger, I used to open with the f pawn, which is the pawn one over from the king, because there's very little book. And I always hated studying the books to memorize all the different types of moves. So I've, I've, I've varied over the years. Okay, thanks. You Thank have you. any advice for young Tanish, Alan? Well, you know, if you want to see the game that got me my master's rating, on my biography page on pega.com, you can actually, there's actually a couple of links, and one of them is to a New York Times article that has the game where I, I won in the last round in the World Open and tied it to, for the 75 World Open Championship. It's a good game. It's an old notation, so it requires a little. So it's an interesting one to use. And there's also a short video, a two, three minute video of me playing with Magnus Carlsen, the current oh. world champion, against Gary Kasparov. Okay. Uh, so if you like chess, you might get a little kick out of the, the little video and the other piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks so much. I've got a couple of questions more. Uh, Natish, if there is time, I can just ask them. You got one one more left. Okay, one more, then I'll stick to one. The, the, the second one was actually more interesting, but in selfish interest, I'll ask the other one. Uh, we want you to tell us one thing you love about Tekem and one thing you'd want to change about Tekem. Oh, I, I, I love that the persistence and the passion as a partner. 
but the reason it was so easy to commit to Tech M is we really felt that the people we knew, we knew, despite what had happened at the corporate level, the people we worked with day to day were very committed and honorable and uh, easy to, to work with. What I'd love to change about Tech M is to have twice as many people certified on Pega and certified on the most recent versions so that you can help us lead because I can see the number of certified people you have, and I can see the versions they're certified on. It's one of our systems. And uh, I've been I've been told, though, CP, that TechM has sworn that they're going to do this going forward with our new partner team. So I look forward to being able to do a progress check in six this months. Is, thank you. Thank you, Alan. And clearly, I knew there will be a homework for me. <laughs> 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 intensity, CP, intensity. That is what it is. <laughs> so I accept the homework. Uh, and uh, we should have known we are playing against a grandmaster. The only good news is the grandmaster and we are on the same side. <laughs> we should both want this very much. Very much. Hey, I'm sorry, but I have to jump on another one thank of these crazy calls. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care, so everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.